let's get into it soul not for sale podcast we are talking about the pandemic treaty the who's pandemic treaty apparently this thing is going to get hashed out and possibly signed off on sometime in may so we're talking about 11 10 9 weeks away where some wild things could take place now joe rogan's going to be talking about that as well as some other things then we're going to start exploring that topic i decided to actually go to the head of the world health organization and hear what he has to say in regards to this treaty and its importance and why it should be implemented then i got brett weinstein talking about why it should not be implemented then i have someone in parliament actually discussing breaking down like reading the actual treaty and everything that it entails a lot of it not every single thing because it's not that long of a clip but a lot of it and then from there and this what this guy says is just wild to me and then we have the last word brett weinstein he's talking about something called turnkey totalitarianism something i have not heard of before but it's very interesting i want you guys to hear it let's get into it don't forget about iamcoachcolin.com we got soul not for sale stuff we got cancel hollywood which i'm wearing right now stop worshiping celebrities public enemy number one anti-mainstream stuff your discount code is i am coach colin all capital letters all one word one l in name colin gets you 10 percent off let's go without being angry at it or trying to pick holes at it instead of just like objectively trying to analyze like is this possible that this is true and isn't it something that governments and dictators and kings have done throughout history haven't they done things to, in order to initiate more power? Haven't they had false flags? Haven't they created conflict that wasn't real in order for them to gain more power yeah. or, or start wars? Yeah, they have. Yeah. What, what makes us think they don't do that anymore? And if you're doing it in this digital battlefield that we're all currently involved in, you, that's what you would use. Yeah. You, you would use social media platforms and you would control them like the FBI was trying to control Twitter. Yeah. They were in, infiltrating social media organizations to suppress legitimate opinions and thoughts of actual experts. Yeah, and, for sure. And they were doing that at the behest of the government, which is fucking terrifying. Yeah, and illegal, but they found workarounds and, you know, the, the, this is a huge, huge risk. But, I mean, look for these kids or whatever. Like, let's look at three populations and say, maybe this will wake somebody up. How are they going to treat you? So the three populations are the revolutionaries themselves, the communists. We'll just look historically and then say American classical liberals, right? And then Christians. So what's going to happen? So you go woke, right? And you're in this and then the revolution succeeds. What have communists always historically done? They always eat their own. Yuri says, Yuri Beznamov says that too, right? He says, don't deal with those political prostitutes. They know too much. We'll line them up against the wall and shoot them. That's what he says. So th your, your chances are, are bad at best under the revolution. What, 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 what are American, you know, good old Americans going to do? If, you know, you come out of being woke. Well, actually, we don't have to talk about the revolution. What are other woke people going to do to you if you stop being woke? They're going to treat you like a traitor. They're going to hate you. They're going to destroy your social life, maybe your professional life. What are normal Americans going to do? Like, cool, you do you, right? Live your life. Glad that you got that sorted out. And what are Christians going to do? I forgive you. That's literally their religion. Right. I forgive you. If you repent, come join our church if you want to. If you don't, I understand. Right. You're welcome. No big deal. Like, if they're Christians who are Christians, I mean, I know that there's these Christian fascist dudes who are thinking they can pound their chest and like be big tough guys. But even the other Christians are like, that's not biblically sound. Like Jesus didn't do that. Right. So, so it's like the woke are going to treat you like crap if you leave. So you're locked in. If you come over and be an American again, just a normal American dude, we're going to be like, cool, welcome back. And the Christians are if you go and like repent of your errors or whatever and you decide to convert, are going to be like, they're going to celebrate you. They're going to be like, praise God. It's night and day different. So – Revolutionaries destroy their own and everybody else, like you're saying, like just normal people who value, like what, pro what, what productive thing can you do? Love you. Great. Welcome. Are completely the other story. Well, that's an ideology to live your life by. The problem is if that ideology gets manipulated by the people in power as well. It's all dangerous. It's all dangerous because it's just what human beings do when they get into power. And mm -hmm. if there was a radical right wing uh, religious sect that was in control of this country, we'd be just as scared. Yeah. As if there's a radical left wing, progressive, woke organization like there is currently. That's, Joe, that's the history of the 1930s right yeah. there in Europe. You had the communists who were screwing everything up and everybody was scared of the radical left. And what was their answer it was fascism. Mm -hmm. I read all this Mussolini a couple of months ago. I was like, well, I better read the other side. And I'm like, this guy is he's supposed to be the answer, but he's making an idol of the state. Yeah. Like the state is God in both situations. And who are you? You're right. you're a subject is who you are. 
Yeah. You know, my friend Duncan Trussell, when the George Floyd riots were happening in California, he was like, dude, we're going to get a radical right wing president. That was his thought. It's like, th- this is what's scary to me. That's scary to and me, too. That, that's just that's as scary, if not more. When when Christians, the, the really crazy ones that we are talking about that don't represent the actual teachings of Christ. Yeah. When those people think that there's like a holy war that they're a part of and that, you know, they have to oppose all the other people and they're the ones who get to enforce the rules and they're the ones who get to enforce what people say and can and can't do. And, and if you say, God damn it, you go to jail for a year. Yeah. That kind of shit's real. It is. And that's that's what you see in some countries that have radical Islam. That's what you see in some countries. That's right. That, aren't open societies air quotes well i mean legitimately ones not yeah you know George Soros's ones. weird right. fantasy about it so it's like that's that's so important for people to understand because the 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 line you know solzhenitsyn said the line of good and evil cuts through every human heart but so does the line of of tyranny then the people who are afraid or they're angry or they feel like they've been robbed or cheated or oppressed can be radicalized really easily and become very angry like germans during dangerous. world war ii right and the, what a lot of people need to understand is that if we put our tinfoil hat back on and we believe that there are people pulling strings, I promise you they do not care whether a radical left or a radical right breaks the Constitution as long as the Constitution gets broken. Well, especially if you can get the radical left to behave in a way that was completely opposed to what the radical left was like 20 years ago. The full trust of the pharmaceutical drug companies, support of the military industrial complex, support of international wars as long as they're being supported by the Democrats. Huge banks. But it's, it's like bizarre. I'm sure Larry Fink has the best of intentions. You know, it's like, what are you talking about? Larry, guys- was Larry Fink? No. Larry Silverstein was the guy who owned uh, the, the big conspiracy theory about World Trade Center Tower 7. Oh, yeah. Something like that. Larry no, Larry Fink owns BlackRock. Right. That's right. Yeah. I get my Larrys confused. Yeah, well, the, there's a lot of Larrys. But the... the the idea that we could live in this world where if this stuff takes over, that eventually they don't come for you, is so silly. They keep, they eat their own. Every, it's, it keeps going further and further down what you thought was acceptable, and it changes the norms, and it just keeps going. It's just like with ESG. They can change the rules tomorrow. The real danger of ESG isn't that it's stupid and that it's control. It's that it's arbitrary. Somebody in some room, maybe it's Larry Fink, maybe he's got a little committee, I don't know, gets to decide that today Elon Musk is okay with ESG and then tomorrow he bought Twitter and is for free speech and now he's not okay with ESG. Or that uh, Halliburton is bad and now it's good. Like overnight, somebody gets to decide. So maybe what, you know, the WHO treaty, we stopped talking about the WHO and I should talk about that. There in May, at the end of May, they are, the WHO is meeting, it's uh, some kind of an assembly, and they are deciding upon whether or not the WHO will have total, they just screwed up one pandemic, and then they say that they need to have total control of pandemic preparedness and public health. But the thing is, is they, it's not even just about diseases, right? Because we know about, like, they screwed up COVID. It was total global tyranny. Imagine if they had the power where there is no Florida. There's no free state. There's no difference between Texas and California. It's all whatever the World Health Organization says. There's no difference between Florida and Canada. Or there's no Sweden, which, you know, did something different. Everything has to be on the same page. But then they go further and they declare other things matters of public health, like gun violence is a public health threat, racial injustice, inadequate food systems. It's a it's a it's literally a recipe for them to be able to declare total total tyranny, but particularly over matters, anything that they can 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 skew as a public health. And so one of the things that they consider to be another kind of pandemic that's a public health risk is misinformation and disinformation. So it explicitly calls for censorship of what would be misinformation and disinformation. So now all of these 100 and whatever, 93 or whatever it is countries are supposed to sign over to the World Health Organization the ability through a treaty that's not being ratified in the Senate like a treaty. It's a, probably Joe Biden will do it as an executive agreement rather than as passing two-thirds majority in the Senate. So we have this treaty now that hands over the control of the states and of the United States as a federal entity to the World Health Organization, which is led by, I mean, Tedros is openly a Marxist, so like what the hell's going on with that, where they have this total blanket control over anything they can declare public health, including misinformation and disinformation. One of the things they say, and uh, I don't know if it's in the, the, the proposal or if it's in the documentation around it, is that we have a pandemic of too much information. We have to limit how much information that people actually are getting. And this is like, that's like living in, in China. This is proposed. Has any country signed off on this? I think Canada's like already gung-ho on it, but I think the meet I don't know exactly how it works, but I think the meeting is at the end of May and there is no full signing off until the meeting at the end of May. So we got like 11 weeks to, if it, for example, if we could get just make it through, you know, whatever Congress or whatever apparatus is where it has to be ratified in the United States as a treaty, according to the constitution, it's dead in the water for the U.S. because the United States, uh, two thirds of the senators are not going to go for this unless we're in a lot bigger trouble than I think we are. Um, 
50-50 would. Who but, the fuck is going to go for that? Uh, Joe Biden. <laughs> yep. Uh, pretty much. Now, I'm going to just go through some things that I actually couldn't find. I couldn't find the head of the uh, World Health Organization, uh, Tedros is his name. I couldn't find any information about him being an open Marxist. I couldn't find that. Um, and there was something else that I couldn't find as well. I couldn't find Joe Biden on video embracing the treaty. But I will say this. Donald Trump wanted to take himself, well, himself, he wanted to take the country out of the World Health Organization. And Joe Biden on, here, I actually have it here. I think on January 20th, yep. Let's see here, January 20th. January 20th, he uh, he reinstated. So he retracted tr Donald Trump's withdrawing from the WHO uh, and appointed Anthony Fauci uh, of the committee and being on the uh, WHO's executive committee. So he, he overturned what Donald Trump did, which now, looking at what James is talking about, would be great because you'd have nothing to worry about. It wouldn't, hap it wouldn't matter what happens in May because the United States of America wouldn't be a part of the World Health Organization, period. So when they're like, hey, will you, you want to sign off on this treaty? They'd be like, no, we don't want anything to do with you. And that would have been great. But Biden kind of went back. So it does seem like Joe Biden is for this type of thing. Now, we're going to get into it some more. The uh, head of the World Health Organization, he's going to be speaking on some things. Just wanted to say quickly that... The one thing that he said that stood out to me, well, the whole thing about the health treaty, that the, 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 the pandemic treaty, that stood out the most. But then communists, revolutionaries, they shun you. Classic liberals will accept you. Christians will embrace you. If you think about that now, who I think you already touched on this, but who are the communists and, and revolutionaries, right? It's obviously the woke crowd. It's exactly what they do. They will shun you no matter what. If you step out of line, the slightest, the second that your values or point of view do not align, they will shun you. They might even attack you depending on what kind of setting you're in, especially if you're at a protest and they figure out that you're not on the side that they're on. All of a sudden, you're subject to attacks, like real attacks. People get umbrellas in your face. They're shouting you down. Maybe someone has a bullhorn that they're squeezing in your face, all sorts of things. So interesting that it, this is still the way it's going and it just kind of solidifies my thought process on how this woke movement is just the communist movement that's all it is it's just communism just hidden now i'm going to show you a video of the head of the world health organization talking about the importance of this treaty and i'll let you decide after i show you some stuff from brett weinstein and everybody else let's go Dear colleagues and friends, as you know, there have been several reviews of the global response to the pandemic with many recommendations for strengthening global health security. They all recognize the need for better systems and tools, better financing, including for global public goods such as vaccines, better global governance, and a stronger, empowered, and sustainably financed WHO. To connect and underpin these ideas, I believe the time is right for an international treaty or other legally binding instrument to provide the framework for a more coherent and coordinated response to future epidemics and pandemics. Whatever new structures or mechanisms are established, they must promote equity and galvanize the engagement and ownership of all countries. They must be multi-sectoral, involving partners from across the One Health spectrum. They must be coherent with the international health regulations. They must be rooted in the constitutional mandate of WHO. And they must be accountable and transparent. 
Thank you for your engagement in discussing and analyzing the legal tools available for pandemic preparedness as we prepare for the special session of the World Health Assembly in November. The pandemic has taught us many lessons. The most important is that we're one species sharing one planet and we have no future but a shared future. It's very interesting the way, because when I was younger, if you brought up one world government, you were, you were, you're silly. You're talking absolute nonsense. And then as you got older, you're like, some people would be like, okay, maybe, okay, maybe. It's, it's funny how they just go step by step, like inch by inch towards this one world type of government. So like, I mean, he even said, we need global governance in this whole thing. And it seems like it's just health. But as we go through the video, you'll realize that it's not just health that he's talking about. And again, we're just going inch by inch towards this one global governance. And again, and I've brought this up so many times, it's in the name of inclusivity and being a good person. I want to be a good person. It's just it's just on a country level. It's like, don't you don't you other governments want to be good people? Don't you want to do what's right for everybody? Well, come on. Let's all get on the same page. Isn't it good to get on the same page? Let's include everybody. Inclusion's good, right? That's what it seems like as they talk about this whole thing. But let's just hear from Brett Weinstein and let's see if you uh, you feel the same way once the time once he's done. So you're saying that an international health organization could just end the First Amendment in the United States? Yes, and in fact, um, as much as this sounds, I know that it sounds preposterous, but it does the, not sound preposterous. <laughs> the ability to do it is currently under discussion at the international level. And it's almost impossible to exaggerate how troubling what is being discussed is. In fact, I think it is fair to say that we are in the middle of a coup that we are actually facing the elimination of our national and our personal sovereignty, and that that is the purpose of what is being constructed, that it has been um, written in such a way that you are, your eyes are supposed to glaze over That's right. as you attempt to sort out what is, it, uh, what is under discussion. And if you do that, then come May of this year, your nation is almost certain to sign on to an agreement that in some utterly vaguely described future circumstance, a public health emergency, which the director general of the World Health Organization has total liberty to define in any way that he sees fit. In other words, nothing prevents um, climate change from being declared a public health emergency that would trigger the provisions of these modifications. And in the case that some emergency or some uh, pretense of an emergency shows up, the provisions that would kick in are um, beyond John dropping. So before you get into it, and I, sh I just want to thank you, by the way, for taking the time to go through this proposal, because you're absolutely right. It's, it's impenetrable. It's designed to be to cloak what they're saying rather than eliminate it, um, what's it called? <laughs> well, the funny thing is actually I was looking um, this morning to find out what the current name is, and the names have actually been shifted slightly, clearly a feature. Oh, it's a shape-shifting it, yeah, it, <laughs> agreement. Yeah, it is. So <laughs> what I would do in order, uh, and and I, I, it's unclear to me how much that's just simply designed to confuse somebody who tries to sort it out and how much that's designed to, for example, um, game the search engine technology that right. might allow you to track the changes because to the extent that the name has shifted. Um, so smart. I call it the um, World Health Organization Pandemic Preparedness Plan, right? And what is under discussion uh, are some modifications to the global public health regulations and modifications to an existing treaty. But all of this makes it sound minor and procedural. What has been proposed 
are, uh, and I, again, the number of things included here is incredible. It's hard even for those of us who have been focused on this to track all of the important things under discussion and to, to deduce the meaning of some of the more subtle provisions. But um, they, uh, the World Health Organization and its signatory nations will um, be allowed to define a public health emergency uh, on any basis that having declared one, they will be entitled to mandate remedies. The remedies that are named include um, vaccines. Uh, gene therapy technology is literally named in uh, the set of things that the World Health Organization is going to reserve the right to mandate, um, that it will be in a position to um, require these things of citizens, that it will be in a position to uh, dictate our ability to travel, in other words, passports that would be predicated on one having accepted uh, these technologies are um, clearly being described. It would have the ability to forbid the use of other medications. So this looks like they're preparing for a rerun where they can just simply take ivermectin, hydroxychloroquine uh, off the table. Um, they also have reserved the ability to dictate how these uh, measures are discussed that censorship is described here as well, the right to dictate that, that, of course, misinformation is how they're going to describe it. Well, in fact, I want to ask you to pause and play a, a soundbite from Tedros, um, in which he alludes to this, and I want to get your assessment of it. Here it is. We continue to see misinformation on social media and in mainstream media about the pandemic accord that countries are now negotiating. The claim that the accord will cede power to WHO is quite simply false. It's fake news. Countries will decide what the accord says, and countries alone. And countries will implement the accord in line with their own national laws. No country will cede any sovereignty to WHO. If any politician, business person, or anyone at all is confused about what the pandemic accord is and isn't, we would be more than happy to discuss it and explain it. So he's going to be more than happy to discuss and explain the misinformation that you're <laughs> yeah, that is, <laughs> now spreading. That is comforting. Um, well, on the one hand, I must say I had not seen that, and um, it is tremendously good news, actually. What it means is that once again, we have managed to raise awareness of something in time that there is uh, conceivably a better outcome still available to us. So they're spooked enough to bother to lie about there's, it. There's, you couldn't have said it uh, more accurately. Yes, those, those were clearly lies. And of course, uh, his saying that into a camera is supposed to convince you, you know, nobody could possibly lie so directly. So there must be some truth in what he's saying, which is, of course, nonsense and Anybody who goes back through uh, uh, Matt Orfala's compendium of various things that people have said into cameras over the course of COVID that they then swear they didn't say, you know, months later, um, knows that these folks are very comfortable at saying totally false things into a camera. It doesn't cause them to, to think twice or sweat or anything. Um, but it's great that we have managed to raise enough awareness that Tedros is actually addressing uh, our spreading of what it actually is, is malinformation. Um, you're aware of this, uh, this extension? No. Yeah. Malinformation. It is uh, information that is true, but could cause things like hesitancy. It can cause things like distrust. It can just gum up the works of a, a certain narrative that's being pushed in the mainstream media. That's what malinformation is. It's information that's true, that could cause damage to the current system. So, why? <laughs> I would love. I I should look into who actually came up with that term. Now, Brett Weinstein. He said a lot of different things there, right? He's going through a lot of it. He's uh, he's he talks in depth when he talks about something. 
this guy's gonna talk even more in depth. Now, what's this, this, what this gentleman is doing, he's actually reading a certain section of the treaty. He's going through it. So he's reading it off. He has it in front of him and he's reading it. He's in parliament in his country right now. And he's very, very, very concerned. One thing that concerns me right away is that Brett Weinstein said, the way it's written makes your eyes glaze over. It really does. If you can find it, here's the thing to do. If you could find it, you find it, copy and paste into chat GPT and say, explain this to me like I'm in grade four. That's, that's what you'd have to do. Not that you're in grade four, but you know what I mean? It would make it very, very simple to read. Otherwise, when you read these things, it's written in such a way that you won't understand. And here's the thing. Most of these countries that will sign on to this, because some will, and I'm looking out for those that don't, though, because those are the hot spots to be in for sure. But the ones that are willing to, they're going to treat this the same way a senator will treat a bill. If they're on board, they're on board. If they want to just be inclusive, if they want to just be good people, if they want to just do the ultimate virtue signal and sign up their entire country, they're just going to do it. They're not going to read through the whole thing. They're just going to get the gist of it from someone in their deep state, assistant, handler, etc. And they're just going to sign on to it. So the same way it makes your eyes glaze over, mine, it's going to do the same, same to the person who's reading. You think Biden's actually going to read through this whole thing? You think he's going to be like, ah, oh, guys, I just need the work put aside for about five days. I got to read through this whole thing. You think that's actually happening? I, I, uh, you think Trudeau's like, oh, let me just, no one's reading it. None of these guys who sign off and are signing up mass populations of people are reading this entire thing. And then the fact that the head of the World Health Organization actually said that it's fake news that there will be, um, you know, handing over sovereignty, for lack of a better term. That's not what he said. I'm paraphrasing. But handing over sovereignty is not something that's going to happen. I want you to listen to this video, and you'll make your decision from there. Let's go. Explicitly written down in Article 13a, the proposal, and 42 of the proposal, the commitment that the member states will give when they accept um, these amendments, the commitment that they will have to apply the proposed measures. This is not enough. Further, WHO will most notably reserve and assume the right to define as the sole instance of, on this planet and to control all information that it claims to be related to health. And this assumes as well the right for censorship and the right to interfere in social communication. It seems to be so important to the WHO that these provisions can be found in both of the international new agreements in the international health regulations and in the new pandemic treaty. And last but not least of a brief summary that should any time be given once we speak about these new changes is the fact that there is no mechanism foreseen that will allow the people or the member states to challenge the assessment of WHO, whether it is the WHO's assessment about a public health emergency or their assessment with respect to certain measures or when it comes to the imposing, uh, imposing of a regime for what they call vaccination, as experimental as it might be. There will be simply no stop button for none of the member states and not, of course not, for us, the citizens. So now, if we just look at it as a whole, this right of WHO to self-declare, to also authorize, auto-authorize itself to claim a public health emergency of international concern and to maintain it for as long as it wants. Number two, to issue so-called recommendations that will be legally binding and that will be subject to a system of surveillance, surveillance of the people, surveillance of the member states. Then the 
total control and monopoly on information, including the right of censorship, and then the fact that there is no mechanism of control, the control of the WHO, and of correction. What do we have as a result? Well, it is very simple to say. Without the open and the, the open debate, without the possibility of having different opinions, different hypotheses, different methods to be discussed on the ta at the table, there will be no science. And there will be ultimately no democracy. And there will be no legal court proceedings and no justice. If the result is already predefined by one sole authority on this planet, there cannot be, by definition, a proper scientific process, a proper decision-making process. There cannot be any democracy. Number two, it is a basic principle, not only of international law, not only of national or constitutional law, that we have, as human beings, the right to know what we consent to. So, if we ask ourselves, have we been asked, have we been informed about this process that is about to become reality, the answer is no. And there is one important distinction to be made between these two legal instruments. The new pandemic treaty will be considered by WHO itself as a treaty and thereby shall be subject to a national process of debate and um, ratification. But not so for the international health regulations. The international health regulations, by definition of WHO's own uh, writing, when you read the international health regulations, they are qualified as health regulations according to the WHO Constitution, Article 21. And what does that mean? As a consequence, there will be an automatic coming into force right after the vote in 2024. So far, it is still 24 months, but these 24 months have been reduced to 12 months only. So that means that at the end, after May 2025, the international health regulations will become law automatically. So, we will not be asked, we have not been informed, and there will be a process of automatic enactment of the international health regulation. This is about as severe as it can be when it comes to the violation of the principle of an informed consent. This principle does not exist only on the individual level, but it exists only also for democracies as a whole. And it, is, it exists under the title of self-determination of the people, which is one of the founding principles of the United Nations in the United Nations Charter, Article 1 of 1946. Now, this is the reason why we should all get to know not only what is in these documents, but we shall claim and clearly say that some of these um, international health regulations and the changes that are modified and declared there will totally be opposed to what we consider our constitutional order. As there is no public information right, as there will be censorship, as there will be human rights not protected, as uh, there will be no checks and balances, as actually it will be the WHO to determine under which legal status we will have to live. That means the power will not be anymore in the hands of the people. And therefore... Oh, wow. This video is called The Grab the the power grab of who that gentleman's name is philip cruz believe i'm saying that right it's k-r-u-s-e he's from the netherlands he's very concerned about what's going on he's trying to alert the people he's trying to alert his government very interesting stuff so again you know we got esg 
And ESG controls companies, and that in turn controls industry, and then that in, in turn controls people. Because once an industry is controlled, and you know you go into a place and they're like, we don't accept cash, and you're like, well, I'll go to a place that that accepts cash, and then you go into nine other places and none of them do. Eventually, you're just gonna get your card out. You know, it goes back to Larry Fink talking about controlling or forcing behavior. Now, we have with this, we have the WHO. They'll control a country, control a government, and that will in turn control the people. Both of these things, ESG and this treaty, are worldwide things. So this is just, in my mind, you know, knowing about the whole one world government talk is just another push for that type of thing. And I know for years it sounded ridiculous. People have always said it sounds ridiculous. Nobody, everybody's eyes glaze over if you bring up one world government because they don't know what you're talking about. But as you start to learn about things like this, I don't know, seems like a play for that type of, th and, and the one thing that's missing is some kind of alien type of thing that happens where everybody kind of huddles together and go, oh, we're all one species. That's even what Tedro said in that first clip that I showed you. He said, we're one species living on one planet. You know, that, that would be the deciding factor that would like get everybody together. But these two things right now are really pushes for that. Now, the last clip I'm gonna play for you is Brett Weinstein talking about, oh no, not Biden, not Biden. It's gonna be Brett Weinstein talking about turnkey totalitarianism. Listen to this. Information is actually exactly what you need to know about to see um, how antiquated that notion is because um, this is actually the Department of Homeland Security actually issued a memo um, in which it defined three kinds of, I kid you not, terrorism, mis, dis, and malinformation. Misinformation are errors. Uh, disinformation are intentional errors, lies, and malinformation are things that are based in truth but cause you to distrust authority. <laughs> <laughs> so malinformation is what you commit when you catch them lying. Yes, um, exactly. Um, yeah, it is, it is discussing the lies of your, your government uh, is malinformation and therefore a kind of terrorism, which I should point out, as funny as that is and as obviously Orwellian as that is, it's also terrifying because if you have cracked the history of the spreading tyranny from the beginning of the war on terror, you know that terrorism is not a normal English word the way it once was. Terrorism is now a legal designation that causes all of your rights to evaporate. So at the point that the Department of Homeland Security says that you are guilty of a kind of terrorism for saying true things that cause you to distrust your government, they are also telling you something about what rights they have to silence you. They are not normal rights. So um, these things are all uh, terrifying, and I do think as much as my jaws open, <laughs> the, the COVID pandemic caused us to become aware of a lot of structures that had been built around us. Something that um, former NSA officer William Binney once described as the turnkey totalitarian state. The totalitarian state is erected around you, but it's not activated. And then once it's built, the key gets turned. And so we are now seeing, I believe, something that even outstrips William Binney's description because it's the turnkey totalitarian planet, right? The World Health Organization is above the level of nations and it is going to be in a position, if uh, these provisions pass, to dictate to nations how they are to treat their own citizens, to override their constitutions, despite what Tedros has just told you. Um, so that is um, frightening. It's not inherently about health. What I think has happened is the fact of a possible pandemic causes a loophole in the mind. It's not a loophole in our governance documents. Our constitution doesn't describe you know, exemptions from your rights during time of a pandemic emergency. Your rights simply are what they are, and they're not supposed to go anywhere um, just because there's a disease spreading. Um, but nonetheless, um, people's willingness to accept the erosion of their rights because of a public health emergency um, has allowed this tyranny to, to use it as a Trojan horse. Yes. And I think that's also, um, it's something people need to become aware of, that uh, there are a number of 
features of our environment that are um, basically they are blind spots that we can't see past. It's very, very interesting stuff. Turnkey totalitarianism. So when you think of that, the description of it being erected around you, but it's not yet activated. I think I can see that in a lot of things that are going on in the world. I'm sure you can, too. And we felt it in the past, you know, four or five years. We felt it actually kind of spring up and we we're all like, huh? You know, and some of us didn't mind. Some of us were fine with it. And the only reason we we're fine with it is because what Brett just brought up, the loophole in your mind. Well, I want my freedom and my sovereignty and everything like that. But if I'm very scared, I'm willing to give up all of that if there's someone who is going to save me. If someone who's going to keep me as comfortable as I've been, keep me as safe as I've felt, if they step in, I will hand that over to them. I will let them have that. As long as they give it back. Hopefully they'll give it back. They'll give it back, right? I guess. Maybe. Did they? <laughs> Did they? Did they give it back? I'm not sure. Some of us held on to it. Some of us will never get it back because of things that we did. Just saying. It's very, very interesting. I'd love you guys to look that up. Turnkey totalitarianism in the turnkey planet. I think Brett is right. Once the World Health Organization, once that treaty in everything that it entails, once that gets through in any country, it's uh, that's that's game over. You know, uh, Joe Rogan, of course, you guys know I watch Joe Rogan all the time. You see him right here, right? He always says when it comes to social credit score, it's game over. And that's very true. When he brings that up, he's always like, that's game over. But this is game over too. And the only thing I didn't like about the clip that I showed you is that he didn't dig deeper into it. James obviously knows a lot about it. I can't dictate what Joe talks about, right? I can't do that. But I wish he had dug deeper because even in my researching, trying to find more of Joe's guests talking about this thing, you can't find too much about it. There's little seconds here and there, but he doesn't ever, you know, dig deep into that type of thing. I wish he did, but you know, either I'm sure I'm sure Jamie wouldn't be able to find anything anyway. <laughs> oh man. Funny joke, but uh, not a laughing matter. I definitely would uh, encourage you guys to look into this. If it's supposed to go down in May, be, long, be on the lookout for what's going on. Be on the lookout for, I always say, local gov, who's a part of this, who's on board with it, who's not. Make sure they never get your vote again. Who signed off on this, who hasn't. If there's a president that put the whole country back into the WHO after one great president took everybody out, pretty much saved everyone's sovereignty. I'd kind of look at that and be like, who did what? And kind of make a decision based on that. But that's just me. That's just what I'll be doing. But um, other otherwise, guys, like, subscribe, share, share. It helps tremendously. And let me know what you think in the comments about this whole thing. Is it nothing to worry about or does it sound as dystopian as I think it sounds. I'm out.